I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 is our text. And if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1035. That's 1035. You'll find Luke chapter 12. Be able to follow along with us. And, and as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you're like, hey, I, I want a Bible, just let us know. Message us, message the service host, email us at the, at the church, and we will send you a Bible or deliver you a Bible, uh, depending on if you're local or uh, in Hawaii. So uh, still waiting, still waiting for that invitation. But uh, here's the thing. We want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you ever worry or get anxious? Okay, if, if you didn't raise your hand, are you worried about someone's going to see you raise your hand? Is that, is that it? Because we all worry about stuff. I mean, maybe it's money and finances. Can we pay the bills? Can we fix the car? Are we going to be able to afford to send the kids to college? Are we going to have enough for retirement? Are we ever going to be able to retire? Or maybe it's health, you know, like, hey, am I going to get sick? Or, or am I ever going to get well? And, and uh, by the way, just for the record, if, if you're always worried about getting sick, you might want to stop going to WebMD and freaking yourself out. Don't feed your medical paranoia. You don't need to do that. Or, or maybe you worry about your children and your grandkids. And let's just be honest. After watching the video about Bowdoin and, and the tragedy and the way God's redeeming that, a lot of us have the urge to bubble wrap our kids or grandkids, right? Uh, and, but, you know, we, we worry for their safety, for their health, for their future, for the success, for their happiness. Are they going to fit in? Are they going to be bullied? Are they going to become an addict? Are they going to conquer the world? We don't, we just worry. We worry about our world that we live in. You know, we worry about the economy and inf inflation and what it's doing to us. We worry about the politics and who's going to win what. And we worry about the wars and terrorism and diseases. We worry. I mean, we worry. That's why we as a nation consume anxiety meds like candy. And so tonight, we want to help you with your anxiety. We want to help you with your anxiety. So uh, first thing, let me just say this. If you're on medication for anxiety, depression, please keep taking your medication. Okay? Uh, look, I, I'm not your counselor. I'm not your doctor. And I don't want to pretend. But if that's helping you, don't stop because you hear a message. Okay? So keep taking your medication. If you're seeing a counselor or a therapist, then please continue to do that. Okay? This is not trying to take the place of that. If you need to see a counselor or a therapist, contact us. We've got partnership with lots of them. We'd be glad to refer you and to help you get counseling or therapy if that's what you need. But what we want to do is we want to add to it. Uh, we want to, you to do all that stuff you're doing right now, but we also want you to listen to Jesus. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your situation, we want you to listen to Jesus because he shares practical wisdom that can change our lives, especially when it comes to worry and anxiety. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. I know it's football season, so don't think Baltimore, guys. Okay, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouses nor barns, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So, Jesus said, do not worry, don't be anxious. So, let's pray and go home. 
If only it were that simple, right? And we know what Jesus said, and we hear what he's saying, but it, it's not that simple. So let's examine this passage and understand how we can apply his words and worry less. Okay? So we're going to listen to Jesus. We're going to try to apply his words, because if we apply his words, it's going to change our lives. So first of all, I want you to see that Jesus invites us to trust him. Jesus invites us to trust him. He begins by saying at the, at the very beginning of this passage to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Jesus just says, look, guys, don't be anxious. Don't worry. Now, I want you to understand that when Jesus says this, he is addressing people who are living in subsistence poverty. Not, not American poverty, where everybody has enough to eat if they just go and ask for it. Not, not uh, you know, our kind of poverty, which is, you know, most of the people who qualify as poor in America are richer than about, you know, 80% of the world. What we're talking about is subsistence farmers. They live day to day. If they didn't work that day, they didn't eat that day. They were worried about whether they're going to have enough to feed their family. And they're worried about whether they're going to have enough clothes so they can stay warm when it's cold. Or are they going to actually die of exposure? These were real concerns. Uh, now, there's still people in this world today that live like this. Where, where we put wells in in Mozambique, there are people who are living in grass huts with no electricity, no running water. They have to walk to wells. That's why we're putting wells in, freshwater wells, and get water and take it back. And they have no doors and no windows, and they're living day to day. And there's no social system to take care of them, make sure they don't starve or anything like that. So for these people, food and clothing were their real concerns. And Jesus told them, you can trust God. He cares for you. That's, that's the whole message that he pour, pours in there. You can trust God because God cares for you. He even calls him Father. Your Father knows what you need. And then Jesus kind of adds that statement that rings true in our lives just as much as in their lives. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Hmm. The answer is none of us. So let me just ask you, does, does worrying about anything help at all? Does worrying about anything solve the problem? No, it, it doesn't. And, and we all know that, and yet we still worry, right? We're still anxious. We lose sleep, and we sweat about it, worry about it. And Jesus, in the midst of our worry, just says, guys, trust me. He invites us to trust him. So let's just be really blunt. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus actually died on a cross to pay for the sins of the world, and he was buried and he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, I want you to understand, you are trusting Jesus to forgive your sins and take you to heaven. Right? Okay, you guys got, you got that, right? You, you believe that because you've, you've asked Jesus to come into your life. You've said, forgive me of my sins. You believe that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Some of you are hoping that he comes back and takes you there so you don't have to die. I get that. That sounds really good. But, um, but that's what you're trusting Jesus with. And since we're trusting Jesus with our soul, wouldn't it make sense to trust Jesus with the rest of our lives? Like, for instance, Jesus wants us to trust him with the unknown. Trust Jesus with the unknown. What do you mean by the unknown? I'm talking about the future. The future. See, God knows the future. We do not. And anybody who tells you they know the future, just ask him where they were in February of 2020. Missing out the whole COVID thing. Right? Because there's not one of us that called that. There's not one of us that got that right. And, you know, oh, it's going to be a big deal. Yeah, but we didn't think it was going to be that big a deal. So, to, and, and basically, God says to try and discover the future is idolatry because it's us trying to play God because God knows the future. We do not. When we want to try to discern the future or figure out the future or know the future, then we're trying to take the place of God. By the way, that's why the Bible condemns horoscopes and fortune telling and psychics and palm reading and seances and Ouija boards and all that stuff because we're trying to know what God says we don't need to know. So if you're doing that stuff, are you trusting God? Like, well, I'm just messing around. Okay, do you trust Jesus or do you want to trust yourself? Because Jesus says, don't bother with that. You don't need to know the future. What you need to do is trust me with the unknown. 
So God knows our future, and he's promised to be with us every step of the way and forever. So Jesus just says, look, I'm going to be with you. Trust me. So God wants us to trust him to lead us, to redeem us, to heal our hurts, and restore our brokenness. That, that's what he's inviting us to. And, and, and here's the truth anyway. There's not one of us in here that can control the outcomes of anything. That's right. You can't control what events happen or don't happen or what other people do or don't do. You know what you can control? You're, you're, well, most of us can't control ourselves. <laughs> I wasn't even going to say I can control myself because I'm out of control a lot, but we can control our choices. That's it. I got a decision in front of me. I can make the decision. That's what I'm in control of. I'm not in control of my wife's decision. I'm not in control of my kids' decisions. I'm not in control of your guys' decisions. It's very freeing, by the way, when I let go of that. Uh, and, and so I'm in control of my choices, and so I choose to reflect the character of Christ. Why not choose to reflect the character of Jesus? Because you can't go wrong that way because you're trusting Jesus. So if you can't control it, stop worrying about it and trust God with it. Because if you're trying to control outcomes, your life is going to be dominated by anxiety. Because nobody's going to do what you want them to do. Your dog doesn't even do what you want him to do. <laughs> right? So trust Jesus with the unknown and trust Jesus with our possessions. Jesus wants us to trust him with our possessions. And let's just be honest. We worry about stuff, right? We worry about getting stuff. I need that. We worry about having stuff. We worry about losing stuff, which is why we build houses for our stuff now that are way bigger than the houses we live in. Do you guys realize your toys live better than you do? I mean, it's, it's the world we live in because we worry about it. And Jesus tells us. He says, hey, hey, look at me. Jesus goes, God feeds the stupid birds. God clothes the brainless flowers. Do you, do you get a pattern here? He's like, God's going to take care of you in this life and the next. That, that, that's what he's saying. Look, guys, and remember, he's talking to people who got nothing who really are worried about having enough to eat that night. And Jesus has the audacity to say, don't worry about that. And we got too much to eat, which is why everybody goes, hey, are you losing weight? And I go, I'm trying. <laughs> right? We're trying not to eat too much because we've got too much and we still worry about stuff. And then when Jesus is telling them, hey, don't worry about the things, he adds this counsel. If you pick up at the end of this passage, verse 32, Jesus says, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or wear because you get the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide for yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He gives us a pattern to confront the fear of losing our stuff. He says, be generous. Be a good steward. Invest in eternity. He says, if you do this, you can't lose it. Did you catch that? He says, if you'll invest in eternity, in the kingdom of God, the dividends are 100%. You're not going to lose it a bit. It's going to grow, and it's going to mature, and it's going to be a great investment. So when you practice biblical generosity, it frees you from the worry about stuff. It really does. So if your life is wrapped up in what you own, worry is going to be your constant companion. So trust Jesus with the unknown. Jesus wants us to trust him with our possessions and trust Jesus with our relationships. With our relationships. Our spouse. Our children. Our parents. Um, here's just a theory I have. You know why God tells us to love each other so often in Scripture? This is my theory. You know why God tells us over and over and over again to love one another? Because we're terrible at it. <laughs> it's like a remedial lesson. We're going to go back to the beginning because you guys don't have this. And, and if, if we just love better and trust God, it, it will, everything's going to work out better. See, God is our Father who loves us incredibly but doesn't control us or manipulate us. Do, do you realize that? 
If you're a follower of Jesus, God is your heavenly father. He loves you. He's already told you you're going to get the kingdom. But he doesn't try to control you. Could God control you? Yes. Could God manipulate you? Yes. But he doesn't. He gives you freedom. Freedom to follow him or freedom to be an idiot. But he gives you freedom. And we know how we do on those choices. But God just, he loves us. And so he allows us to, to choose. Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite authors, says it's easier to control people than to love people. Think about that. Are you trying to control your spouse? Are you trying to control your kids? Yes, you have to discipline them and guide them and do that if they're living at home. But are you trying to control them? Are you trying to control the, the people around you? You see, it comes down to trust. Can we trust Jesus to care for our children and our grandchildren? Can we trust Jesus to care for our children and our grandchildren? Yes. Yeah, it's not easy, but we can. Can we trust Jesus to care for our spouse? <laughs> A lot less people are certain about that one. <laughs> you don't know my spouse. God does. Uh, can we trust Jesus to care for and redeem our families? Yes. See, it... it, it it really comes down to this. If we trust Jesus, then we're going to follow Jesus' example and we're going to love better and stop trying to control. Control makes you crazy. It, it creates anxiety because they're not doing what you want them to do. They're not going to do what you want them to do. It, 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 look, it revolutionized, revolutionized our marriage when I stopped trying, asking God to make Merelda the woman I wanted her to be. And I started asking God to make me the husband that she deserved. See, because I can only control this person most of the time. I can't control her at all. But if you want uh, to worry less, stop trying to control your spouse and just love them better. So Jesus invites us to trust him. Okay, he's doing that all the time. He's inviting you and me to trust him more because as we trust him more, the anxiety is going to go down and the faith is going to go up. But please understand what trust looks like because trust is active, it's not passive. Trust is active, it's not passive. Often people get the crazy idea that trusting God means doing nothing and just sitting around waiting for God to act. Well, I'm trusting God. God's going to do this. And can I just tell you that I grew up around a lot of passive faith and passive faith can be really destructive. I'm not saying there's not a time to be still and know that he is God, but there's a lot of passive faith in our churches in America that, that is not healthy and not helpful. Uh, I remember hearing this example, and I love it, so I'll actually tell it, share it with you. So there was this guy, and, and he's in a place where it's, it's flooding, and, and all the news reports say, get out, evacuate, and he's like praying, God, get me out of here, rescue me. And there's a knock on the door. It's a fireman. He says, hey, you got to evacuate, man. It's going to get flooded. And he says, no, I'm trusting God. So the fireman leaves. A little bit later on, he's got to go up to the second floor of his house because it's flooded so bad, and he's there, and a boat comes by. Police officer's in the boat, and he says, hey, man, get in the boat because we're going to rescue you. And he says, no, I'm trusting God. God's going to rescue me. And, and then the flood keeps rising. He goes up on the roof, and uh, here comes a National Guard helicopter, and he drops down the thing. He says, hey, get in the basket. We'll, we'll rescue you. And he says, no, I'm trusting God. God's going to take care of me. So the helicopter flies away, and the floodwaters rise, and the guy drowns. And he gets to heaven, and he's a little irritated. He's like, God, I trusted you to rescue me. Why didn't you rescue me? And God says, you moron. I sent you a fireman, a policeman, and National Guard. And you turned them all down. Welcome to heaven. Uh, so, look, please read the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, almost everywhere you read, trusting involves action. I mean, God said to this man, Abraham, if you don't know the story, it's in Genesis, I want you to move and I'll tell you where to stop when you get there. <laughs> okay, he packed up and moved. God told Moses, when he was 80 years old, I want you to go and lead my people out of slavery. Moses like, okay, I'll sign up for this. Couple weeks, no, 40 years later. He told David, take on this giant. Well, gee, God, can I just sit around and wait for you to kill him? No, you go get some stones and a sling and do it. He, Jesus said to the disciples, hey, leave your business, leave your life, and follow me. See, all that faith required action. So you know what trusting God looks like for us? 
It means that we apply God's word even when we're afraid to do it. It means that we hear and obey Jesus even when life is hard. It means that we live out God's promises even when you're not seeing the results that you want. See, trust is action based on belief. Belief in Jesus, that he really can show up and do anything. I mean, think about it. If you're sick, you go to a doctor. Hopefully not WebMD. You go to a doctor, and if you trust the doctor, you follow their advice, right? You take the meds they prescribe. You, you, stay, you, know, you do whatever treatment they say to do. If you're in legal trouble, you, hopefully you don't go to your idiot cousin who's been in jail four times. You go to an attorney, and you ask the attorney for counsel, and they, they, they give you counsel, and if you trust them, you'll do what they say. Look, if your life is falling apart, go to Jesus. And here's the thing. If you trust Jesus, you will take his words, his counsel, his wisdom, and you will apply them to your life. So are you actively trusting Jesus? I, I mean, I know we all mean to. I'm not talking about intentions. Are you actively trusting your Savior? See, my guess is the answer for all of us at some level is yes and no. Yeah, we're trusting him at some points. No, we need to trust him at these other points. Uh, so we want to trust God more. So let's talk about learning to trust God. We want to learn to trust God. Uh, I'm assuming right now that you want to worry less and trust God more. So do you guys want to worry less and trust God more? Okay. So God wants us to worry less and trust him more. I mean, Jesus has already invited us to trust him. So how do we get there? How do we get to that place of more trust, less worry? Uh, I want to share with you four habits that build trust. I'm going to share them really quickly. So take notes, look them up, all that kind of stuff. But uh, four habits. In other words, these are four actions that you need to take. And you can't just do them once and think everything's going to be good. These are things you need to build into your life. So they are repetitive processes until they become habits in your life that you just do without thinking about it. Okay, and the more you do these, the more trust you're going to have, the less worry you're going to have in your life, less anxiety. So number one, see God's power. If you want to trust more, see God's power. See it in creation. See it in nature. See it in weather, the beauty, the sky. It's been easy lately with the monsoons, hasn't it? Yeah. You're like, yeah, look at the power of God. We're nothing. See, open your eyes to God's awesome power. Read about it in history. Pick up the Bible. Read the Old Testament. See how God delivered his people time and time again. He has the power. And in your life, can you reflect on your life and see the ways that God has worked in your life? to redeem you, to heal you, to bless you. And, and by the way, if you can't do that, then schedule an appointment with one of our pastors. We'll help you do that. Uh, we'll help you to see your life uh, that God is redeeming. And by the way, the more you practice this, the easier it, is, it becomes to see God's power in your life and to trust him in the moment of uncertainty. So first of all, see God's power. Secondly, embrace God's love. Embrace God's love. We say God loves you. God loves us. And, and we believe it, sort of. I mean, personally, how often do you remember and reflect that God demonstrates his love for you on the cross? I, I mean, 1 John 4.10 puts it this way. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God demonstrates his love for you on the cross. We're going to remember this in a little bit, celebrating communion. But how often do you do that throughout your week? Make it a daily habit, a regular habit for you just to reflect on God's love in your life, the forgiveness of sins, the blessings that you have because every single good thing in your life is a gift from God. And the more that we remember and thank God for his gifts, the more we embrace God's love and the more we grow in trust. Third thing, hope in God's promises. God's promises will change our attitude if we learn to live in them daily. And that means you got to remind yourself, hey, this is one of God's promises. i got to live in it. And I want to share kind of two big promises that I really want to dominate your thinking. Okay? If you're going to live in God's promises or hope in God's promises, then remember that God promises to be with us. He says repeatedly in Scripture, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So you know that you belong to Jesus. You know he's with you and he's not going to leave you. You're never alone. No matter what you're facing, God is going to be with you and he is going to redeem your brokenness. So when facing a crisis or a problem, don't just freak out and don't ask God, God, what are you doing? 
So that, that's not demonstrating a lot of faith in him. Say, God, how are you going to redeem this? God, I, I, how are we going to get through this? And how are you going to glorify yourself in this? Uh, it changes the attitude when you know that God is with you. And then the second promise, God promises we're going to be with him. Now, that, that's heaven. And, and I know sometimes when I talk about this, people go, yay. And some people go, eee, because I don't, I don't want to die. Okay, I get that. But here's the thing. If we understand the promise that God has prepared a place for us, and one day we're going to be with him, we can live courageously and joyfully, encouragingly, because we know the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. If you're a follower in Jesus, then the best is ahead of you because heaven is ahead of you. You get a new body, you get new life, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more dying, no more pain. All that's done away with. All things are made new. And we're living in a place of perfect love. So uh, we shouldn't be the angry, bitter, defeated Christians complaining about the world and just kind of excited about God's judgment. It's like, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. I can't wait till God shows up and sends all these people to burn. Bring the marshmallows, you know. <laughs> that is not the attitude we need to have. Look, I, I just be honest. I don't like the direction of our nation and world. I mean, there's godlessness everywhere. Evil is glorified. But my hope is not in this world. Okay? I know I'm loved. I know God is with me. And I know it only gets better because Jesus has already won and we're on his team. So, uh, yeah, see, I, I think that, see, that, that'll change your attitude about how you live your life. So hold on to God's promises. Live in the hope of God's promises. And then finally, seek God's kingdom. That's what Jesus said, verse 31. Instead, seek God's kingdom and these things will be added to you. Get your priorities right and seek the kingdom of God. Seeking his kingdom means you are living on mission. It means that you're investing your life in building God's kingdom, not your estate. So what does that mean? That means serve other people instead of living selfishly. I actually spoke with a counselor before I wrote this message, and I said, hey, what, what do you tell people who are filled with anxiety and fear and worry? And she said, uh, I tell them to serve people. I tell them to serve people because it, that way they're, they're focused on others instead of themselves and they're focused on others' needs instead of their own fears. And I was like, that's awesome because once again, Jesus is right. He's right. Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious. What do you do? You invest in the kingdom of God. So when we follow Jesus, when we serve others, when we invest our lives in his mission, we increase joy and peace and contentment and we have less fear, anxiety, and worry. So what kind of life do you want? Jesus is inviting you to trust him. So today, are you going to take some actions to build your faith? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We know that you love us best. We know you love us first, but we still love you. And God, we want to trust you more. We, we really want less anxiety and worry in our life. We want you to, to heal us of that. But, but God, we know that means that we need to seek to trust you more each and every day. So Father, help us to do that. Help us to try to build faith into our life. Whether we need to see your power and claim it and understand it. Whether we just need to, to hold on to your promises or invest in your kingdom. Uh, or just know that we are loved by you. God, speak to our hearts right now. And let us encounter the power and the healing and the hope of the living God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.